Live from the pitch pad in New York City, get ready to unleash your inner entrepreneur with Hitch Live with Amy Summers. Whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur or just dipping your toes into the shark tank, this is the place to be to discover how to turn your pitch into reality. Fasten your seatbelts, pitch stars, because the spotlight is on you and we are about to make success happen. Get ready for Hitch Live in three, two, one. Welcome to Pitch Live. I'm your host, Amy Summers, founder and president of Pitch Publicity and Anisi Vox. I'm also a hardworking entrepreneur who is passionate about helping you reach success in any area of your life. And I know that's possible after decades of experience with pitching and enhancing communication skills, which is why I am so excited to be joined by Kim Kalp today, who is co-founder at Bright Ideas Only. It's a marketing and fan engagement-based agency that has worked with Oprah, the New York Mets, Justin Bieber, Disney Jr., and many other A-listers um, to create new ideas for programs, revenue streams, and branding. And prior to starting this new venture in 2021, um, Kim gained global acclaim for Zine Pack and the Superfan Company. Um, she was recognized as Startup of the Year by the Wall Street Journal. And she also made a splash on season five of Shark Tank, securing offers from four out of five sharks for Zine Pack. So welcome, Kim. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. And um, if you're wondering why, Kim, if you're watching us and you're wondering why Kim and I are both wearing blue, <laughs> that's because we were both channeling our alma mater. So Kim and I went to the same university, just not at the same time. Uh, we went to so we do have University of Florida in common and, and Gators, and I'm glad we both sided with blue today. I think that was the feeling. <laughs> We're matching. I love it. We have a great university. Um, I've served on the alumni board. I think, Kim, you're serving on the alumni board now, right? And uh, yes. that's actually how we met originally when I first moved to New York. Um, someone said, okay, you have to go get connected with Kim. And I actually pitched Kim on being on a panel for our Gator alumni here in New York City. Do you remember that? Yes, it was so fun. I, I remember going into your office and I I just remember that moment of walking in your office and I was expecting to go to just an individual office and here I am walking. Was it was it a WeWork that I walked into or was it something else? It, yeah, WeWork. It was a WeWork back in the day. So that was like, was that like 2014 or 15, right? Yeah, I always tell people it's really interesting. We were one of, we were kind of very early on WeWork. So we joined WeWork when Adam had only had two locations in New York. So we were sort of one of those early adopters that uh, were kind of like, yeah, we believe in this concept. I think <laughs> maybe we believed in it a little too much for anybody who's watched the Hulu show. But uh, yeah, we were one of the first people in WeWork. I know that must have been fun watching that show and thinking I was on the ground floor <laughs> when all this craziness shots on Monday and different things were going on. Totally. Yeah, I just remember thinking, wow, what's what's going on here? Because I've always I've been doing remote work since 2010. So walking into that was like, well, no, wait a minute, what is what is going on here? So <laughs> you're Kim is always ahead of the curve and on top of things. So that's what I remember about her. And um, she is, um, the, my pitch was a success. She came on. Uh, we've been following each other on LinkedIn ever since. I will just mention now, you need to follow Kim on LinkedIn. Um, and you need to join her every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern um, because she has a podcast called Coffee with Kim. And um, just a heads up, she doesn't drink coffee. She's a teacher <laughs> like me. <laughs> we have that in common too. Um, but she is always interviewing really inspiring entrepreneurs. And it's just always inspiring to be around you, Kim. Um, you're just, your energy is mm -hmm. infectious. And I'm really excited to dive in and dissect how you make success happen, or as we call it, uh, MSH. So let's go. I, I know that... Um, You've covered Shark Tank a lot, and you're probably tired of talking about Shark Tank. <laughs> Never. But this is Pitch Live, so we're all about dissecting the art of pitching, and I want to talk about it. Um, but before we go into that, um, I just wanted to back up a little bit to give our audience context on your experience, because your experience when you attended the University of Florida was very different than mine. Um, you know, when I was there, it was kind of like, 
get your degree and get out on the street and figure out how to do work. We didn't have um, entrepreneurship stuff, but I, I feel like, again, you're always hitting it when things are happening. Weren't you there at a time when um, something was going on at the business college and you were part of an entrepreneurship program, weren't you? Yeah, I was. I was part of the entrepreneurship minor track, but I but I always tell people, um, I think I was like one class short of having it be an official minor. So, so I think I got like seventy five percent of the way through with the minor, and then senior year, I don't know, maybe I got a little lazy. I was like, I'm not going to take that last class, uh, and so I didn't actually officially get the minor. But uh, I think I get credit. I think I get credit for like seventy five percent, and I still joke all the time that I'm going to go back and do like that one class so that I can officially have a minor, That's but I, I feel like I, yeah, I earned the rest of it out on, out on the streets. Yeah. So just because I didn't have the the opportunity for that, you know, my entrepreneur journey was a little bit different. Um, and you got a little bit of a taste of it in college. I don't feel like I did except for my internships, my outside internships that I did was really the only place that I got that entrepreneurial bug. Um, but looking back on your college experience, you know, was there a specific class you remember taking that really primed you on how to pitch or present that has helped you today? I think the class that helped me the most, and I'm not sure for other colleges what they might offer, but at University of Florida specifically in the business college, they have a program that they started actually one of my first years, I think it was 2004 or five, they piloted a program called the Florida Leadership Academy. And, uh, you know, here we are 15, 16 years later, and that program is still running today. And what they do is they bring back alumni that have succeeded in business realms, whatever that might be, to come for a Friday around lunchtime and talk to a handful of these students. I think when I was there, there was anywhere from 100 to 200 kids that were selected to be part of Florida Leadership Academy. And it was just, it, the class was not for credit. It was just something that you you could do to learn. And I think what really helped me was every Friday they would bring in, maybe it was the CEO of Build-A-Bear, maybe it was a senior vice president at Wells Fargo. And hearing their stories was helpful. But I think to your point, hearing themselves pitch themselves was really interesting because I think one of the biggest gaps that I see is sometimes what people do and then how people describe what they do is actually a very wide delta. Uh, so when we had, for instance, the CEO of Build-A-Bear come in, I think she talked about bears, you know, 5% of the time, you know, 95% of the time it was the storytelling around Build-A-Bear and what it means to people and the connection that it forms between grandparents and kids or parents and kids. And so I think the storytelling in that class was really helpful for me as I went through the rest of my work life, because we're all just telling stories every day. You know, that's interesting that you bring that up because I do think that that's an important part of learning how to pitch. You know, someone might be listening to us now and not really knowing like where to start, you know, honing their pitching skills, but just observing and watching how others pitch. And even if you can't take a college course on it, I think we have a lot of resources today to get inspired, like just watch a bunch of TED Talks or do you ever find yourself doing that now where even in your career now you're you're observing and looking at others and how that they approach subject matters Absolutely. I'm sort of constantly tweaking my my pitch and my storytelling. And one thing that I picked up recently that I, not recently, maybe a couple years ago, but I've been really bullish on people including in their pitch or in their storytelling. And it's actually something that we did on Shark Tank. I sort of got the idea a little bit before that is leading your storytelling at the very end with what's next. So a lot of times people will talk about their current job. You know, I'm the SVP of whatever, whatever. I'm an entrepreneur who's making blankets or whatever it is. And nobody talks about what's next. Nobody talks about, well, I'd like to get these blankets in hotel rooms, or I'd like to get these blankets, you know, on school buses or or whatever it is. And I think when you start talking about the kind of future setting, what's next for you and your business, it opens up an opportunity for the other person, whether that's somebody at a business networking event, whether that's somebody at a birthday party to say, hey, 
you know, my cousin works for a bus company or my aunt works at a hotel chain or my roommate's sister's brother, you know, that sort of classic, uh, what is it? Seven degrees of Kevin Bacon that a lot of times when you, when you put it out there that you're looking to do something, you have no idea, you know, seven degrees away, it might be the perfect person who you want to connect with. So I think when I, when I talk about storytelling, that's, that's something that I always really try to impart on people. Cause I think it's so important. Yeah, leave it open, kind of give it a tease, as they would say in news, um, to get people thinking about how, even how to maybe even connect with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny, we actually, when we went on Shark Tank, that was one of the things that we were really adamant about doing was future setting, talking about where we wanted to take the company. And it paid off because one of the things that we said on the show was that we were really excited to get into sports. We hadn't done any sports projects at that time. And it was something that we were like, we really want to try to do this. And, you know, lucky for us, one of the people sitting at home worked for the New York Mets. And sort of raised his hand and said, maybe I could help with that and reached out. Uh, his name was Wes. He is still a really smart, he runs an agency now, really smart, amazing guy. And to this day, we still have the Mets as a client. So eight years later, that one piece of future setting has paid off in dividends. So I, I always use that as an example to tell people, you never know, you never know where that one sentence of future setting can take you. And bonus, you already had the wardrobe because orange and blue are <laughs> colors too. <laughs> exactly. I was ready to hit the ground running. You're in the zone. So, uh, you know, that's such an important point. And, you know, he wasn't even a judge. He's just sitting watching it at home, um, which, you know, it's a familiar, you know, that it's familiar to me that you say that because I often will tell a lot of my clients that when they're on media interviews, you know, you don't know who's watching. You have no idea who's watching out there. You know, you just show up and um, I love that future setting. I want to go back to, um, you mentioned Shark Tank. So let's go back there. Just um, first of all, what motivated you to go on that show? I know you you um, pitched on that show with your partner at that time uh, for Zine Pack. Uh, what made, motivated you to do that? And then when you signed up, what what were kind of the rules of the Shark Tank? You know, we got lucky. I think early, we were on season five. And so some of the earlier seasons had a rule where you had to give up equity in your company to go on the show. That lasted, I think, seasons one and two. In season three, they did away with that. So there was no sort of upfront cost, quote unquote, to be on the show other than the risk of you might get a bad edit. So I always use the example of American Idol. We all know if we've watched American Idol, there's good singers and there's bad singers. And they don't tell you in the beginning, hey, just so you know, we've categorized you as a bad singer. Of course not. The producers on set are going, yeah, Amy, you this is perfect. Knowing full well that they're going to put you through to the judges and Luke Bryan or Katy Perry or whoever the judges is going to go, oh my gosh, get a load of that guy. You know, completely terrible. This is reality TV, people. Like, we got to have the heroes and the villains, just like there's good singers and bad singers. So the real risk of going on a show like Shark Tank is going, oh, man, I hope they don't edit me to be one of the bad businesses <laughs> where, where the, the sharks go, oh, my God, you know, get out of here. You, you're the worst because... What people don't realize, although when, when I tell you this, you will be like, oh, that makes sense, is that it is the gift that keeps on giving. So what I mean by that is our episode originally aired in 2015, but thanks to all of the MSNBC marathons and ABC late night marathons, our episode re-airs on average two to four times a year. So I will have a big a big spike in our web traffic. I'll have friends or family sending me pictures of them on a Delta flight or them in the gym or them at home. I got one from my dad not too long ago being like, here you are again. And so, you know, it, it really is in some ways for us who had a really great edit, the, the gift that keeps on giving. If you had a bad edit, again, one of those bad singers, um, unfortunately for you, it's like a bad date that's replayed for everybody two to four times a year. So that is, I always tell people, like, caution yourself before you go on any reality TV or pitching yourself because you never know how they're going to edit you. So you obviously made the decision to move forward. Um, tell us a little bit about how you and your 
your co-pitcher on the show, how you both prepared for this. Because knowing that going into it, I'm sure that you you wanted to make sure you were a good pitch. We prepared in a really calculated manner. So we sat down with you know our yellow uh, lined notebooks with a pen and started at season one, episode one. And we actually manually wrote down every single question that the sharks, the judges asked. And then if a question was repeated, so for example, what's your top line revenue? Or how many customers do you have? We would put a little tally mark on the notebook next to that sentence. And we started at season one, episode one. And like I said, we were season five. So we had four seasons worth of content to literally painstakingly tally and collect data from. Then we picked the top 20 questions out of that list that statistically speaking were asked the most. And we said, let's come up with answers to these 20 questions because we can't tell the future. We don't exactly know what they're going to ask us. But using this as a baseline, we at least have a pretty good predictor that at least a few out of these 20 questions we are most likely going to get asked. So let's have clear, crisp, I always call the media bite size ready content to come back with so that we know we're helping out the producers. I always tell people, I think one of the best ways that you can pitch yourself is to know your audience for TV. That's short, that's quick, that's bite size, that's newsworthy. So those are the things we want to hit. If you're pitching, you know, if you're doing an interview with a journalist, you know, much different or a blog or, you know, you're doing something for social media. So I always say kind of know your audience. We knew our audience going in. We knew what questions statistically that they might ask. And so we prepared for exactly that framing. That's really brilliant. How many, just out of curiosity, how many did they ask that you were prepared for? They asked quite a few, but again, in terms of uh, the movie magic, we were actually in there with the sharks, I always say in real life, for over an hour. I think it was like an hour and 15 minutes. But but obviously, for the sake of TV magic, that gets edited down to about eight minutes. So I think we were probably asked, you know, 60 questions in, in the hour, uh, hour and a half that we were in there. But, you know, they they narrow that down. So I think you only saw us answer like, you know, five to 10 actually on, on live TV. Was there a question that really threw you? Do you remember? Um, there, there weren't questions that threw us. There were questions that we knew we didn't want to answer. So I'm sure you have had people come to you with this kind of predicament saying, Amy, I'm so excited to be interviewed by, you know, this blog, this TV show, this newspaper, whatever it is, but I really don't want to answer a question about, whatever it is, my biggest client or why we decided to lay off 10% of the workforce or, you know, what this big new partnership is that we're doing, because there are things that you yourself have signed NDAs on, or you just don't really want to reveal to other people. And so we found ways to navigate that and come up with answers where we were giving a little bit, but never revealing more than we wanted to. And I think that's really important to practice. And it was important for us to practice because I think a lot of times when we're in a setting that we're a little nervous and we're we're feeling a little jittery, at least for me, we have the tendency to overshare. We get a little like anxious and a little diary of the mouth and we just blah. And so really practicing being calm and navigating around these questions and how we could answer them without really revealing too much, that was important. So we had some moments where maybe internally I was going, whoa, I really don't want to answer this question about Walmart because we've signed a big NDA with them. And if we, you know, said this answer on TV, they would, you know, probably absolutely murder us. So really practicing a way to answer the question, sound professional, but not give away so much that we would get in trouble. And that's really sage advice. I think even if you're even if you're pitching yourself in an interview, you know, they might ask you about your former boss or you might want to, you know, emotionally, you might go into why you left that company, but it's not going to serve you well on the back end. So you said a couple of things. I just don't want to pass these by because they're really good tips. So first of all, you prepared by watching the show and multiple shows, taking notes. Um, I think that even if you're not on Shark Tank, 
you could do this in preparation for a media interview. If you watch a journalist, you know, and how they do their interviews, you probably are going to pick up their interview style. You know, Barbara Walters had a style, you know, that was really clear. You know, you can start to pick up on if they're going to be more controversial or if they're going to, you know, keep it light and fluffy, as we like to call it sometimes. Um, but I think that it, we have so much access to technology now. You can really study a person to kind of get their vibe before you go on. And, and I think that was a really good thing that you did. And then also preparing for these, you know, because you put your pitch out there um, and you had a very succinct pitch that you both probably practice. But then, you know, in that type of pitching contest, it can all like go sideways during the Q&A. I mean, you could have a perfect pitch and then not preparing for those questions, which you you both did um, so diligently and really coming up with answers. And I like how you said, you know, you don't want to not answer. I always say, you know, when I'm media training, you know, it's never good to say no comment. That's, <laughs> I mean, that leads up to interpretation, whatever the person wants to now interpret about you. So you always need to say something, but, but give them enough and then help them to pivot and move on to somewhere else that you want to go. Exactly. I always say it's just kind of like remove and redirect. Now, for everyone that maybe hasn't seen the episode, um, what happened as a result? I know that you had four out of five offers. Um, what did you do with those offers? Did you take any of them on? And, and how did you make that decision on what to do next? Yeah. So in real life, we actually did not go through with the offer with, spoiler alert, Robert and Lori, if you haven't watched the episode, what we realized after, you know, it's kind of like getting married on the first date and you're kind of like, well, let's get a chance to get to know each other. Maybe we don't want to get married because I always say taking money or taking an investment from people, that is a marriage. That is a legally binding contract connecting you with another human being or a private equity or an entity of some sort. And just like, it's amazing to me how in business, I think, uh, people will so willy nilly kind of accept money from anyone. But at the same token, if you ask them if they want to marry their girlfriend of three years, they're like, oh, well, I don't know if I'm ready. I'm like, well, you just took money from Joe Schmo, who you've known for like a week. So you don't really know that guy. And now you're business married to him. So, you know, it really is like a marriage. So we were really adamant to kind of get to know them, dig in deep. And what we realized mutually is you know, we're better off as, as friends or dating buddies, you know, we shouldn't actually get married. So we have a wonderful relationship. We actually helped Lori with a bunch of stuff after the show, after we decided not to do a deal when she was redoing her website and her branding and stuff. So we get along with their teams fabulously. We just kind of realized like, I don't know if we want to get actual business married. And that happens quite a bit on the show about 11 to 15% of deals that you see that get done on the show actually happen in real life. So that means the other 85 to 90% do not uh, end up going through. They don't actually get married after meeting for the first time. Yeah. I think they call that, is it the shark tank effect? Is it you're really just getting like what you said, the, the gift that keeps on giving the publicity value out of it? Do you think that that has been the greatest thing for you about being on Shark Tank? Definitely the greatest thing and just the experience. Like it it was really fun. We got to, you know, fly out to California and be in Burbank and be on the sound stage. And so it was also just a lot of fun. We had a really good time with it. So I want to fast forward because um you're you're running your own business now and you're working with a bunch of uh A-lister clients. Um what's your what's your move? Uh, to first <laughs> land an A-lister. I mean, you have all these A-listers on your website. You know, what's the first step in in getting someone in, in your pitch approach? For, for me, the way I go about business is, you know, reputation is everything. If you keep a stellar reputation, the work you will have to do later in life will decrease as time goes on. And that is exactly what we have found. So I have, you know, numerous stories of having a call on my phone from a number that I don't recognize. And, you know, usually I don't answer those, but when I randomly do, you know, it was Mary J. Blige's team calling from a block number. 
I was like, how did you get my personal cell phone number? They had gotten it from Justin Bieber's team because we had worked with them and did such a great job and been so professional and on time and fun to work with. And so I always say your best calling card is your previous clients. That will be your biggest sales tool. So super serving them, making sure they are happy. You know, we work in entertainment. It is a small world, as you know, with, you know, pitching and publicity. It's small. You think it's like this big big magical world. It's not. What goes around comes around. I'm sure with you, Amy, there's people that you've worked with for a decade that, you know, they say your name and someone in the room goes, oh yeah, you know, worked with her five years ago. Super great. That's going to be the type of calling card and sales tool that is just going to move mountains for you more than any PowerPoint, more than any 30 second pitch. So I always tell people, and don't be afraid to ask. I think that is something else that we get a little shy or reserved or scared about that, you know, don't be afraid, especially if you think you did a, a great job to say, hey, can you recommend me to anybody else that you think might want these goods or services? Or, hey, I saw on LinkedIn that you're connected to Amy Summers. I'd love to be on her podcast. Would you mind introducing us? So don't be afraid to kind of put yourself out there a little bit, especially if you think you've done a good job because people in your industry, no matter what industry that is, most likely are very well connected. So first, answer your phone. So let's not forget that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. If you answer your phone, sometimes things, good things do happen. So it might be Mary J. Blige team calling. <laughs> um, and then, <laughs> yeah, I like what you say about that, that really relationship is a very important part, I think, of the pitching process, and especially in the industry that you're serving of entertainment is not just doing a good job, but really developing those relationships because, you know, their circle of trust is small. So if you can get in it, right? <laughs> Um, they're going to share that to their other friends who have also have small circle of trust. Um, you know, is there anything that you can give, kind of give our audiences as, as we're kind of wrapping up here, like more tactical? Uh, is there any best advantage to pitching do you find with clients today? So let's say, let's say you're presenting to a Mary J. Blige or Justin Bieber or whoever. Do you pick a certain day of the week? Is there a certain day of the week that's better? Is there a certain time that's better? Is there a certain format that you find that's better when you're pitching ideas to clients? They came to you and they say, hey, we want to see your ideas for this. And you're going to walk them through one, two, three. Is there anything that you kind of say, I never pitch on a Friday or a Monday? Or do you have any rules like that? I would say there's three things that I try to keep in mind sort of at all times when it comes to these pitches, which is number one, get a warm intro. So if you can, don't go in blind, don't go in, you know, not knowing anything, emailing a random email address, go in with a warm intro. That's number one. Number two, have a LinkedIn profile, have it be filled out, have it be strong. The next question I can hear people asking is, but why Kim, you know, LinkedIn is for, you know, corporate people or old people or not for my industry, or it's a social media account. Who cares? Most people don't realize that Google and LinkedIn are interwoven. They are crawled simultaneously. So if you Google your own name, LinkedIn will always, always, always show up on page one. Even if you have a very generic name like Jason Schwartz, if I put in one piece of information, Jason Schwartz, New York, Jason Schwartz, name of company, your LinkedIn will come up because LinkedIn has been around for 19 years and it it has been crawling Google for that long. It's SEO is beyond strong. That will come up before your website. I'll use myself as an example. I've been on everything from Shark Tank, the Miss USA pageant as a judge to Forbes 30 under 30 at age 40 under 40. To this day, if you Google me, the number one thing that comes up is LinkedIn above Forbes, above Shark Tank, above all these other things. So sneakily, LinkedIn is a really powerful tool. Why do I say this? Because if you get that warm intro, if somebody sends me an email or a text that says, you got to meet Amy Summers, what is the next thing we all do? We all pull out our phone and we Google who the heck is Amy Summers? Because why do I have to talk to her? So have that as a strong sort of reference check that people can look over you quickly and go, okay, Amy Summers looks like she a professional. She knows what she's doing. She's well connected. Her LinkedIn looks strong and filled out. So that's number two. And number three, three, when you pitch, 
know who you're pitching and know how they like to accept pitches. So I don't have any hard and fast rules because some people might say, well, I never pitch on a Friday, but they don't realize, for example, that the person they're pitching is a working mom. And you know what? One of her best days to get work done is on Friday afternoons when the nanny takes the kids to the playground and she gets an uninterrupted two hours because Mondays are crazy for her with trying to get the kids out the door and go to school. So actually Fridays are the days where she catches up on a lot of her phone calls or a lot of her emails. So I think sometimes, when, especially now in a in a world where we're all so digital and we're all so remote, kind of those rules go out the window because you don't know how people are working or when they're working or where they're working. You know, uh, we always joke, my business partner, Abby and I, because we had somebody email us one day at five o'clock on a Friday asking for a call. And we were like, oh, five o'clock on a Friday. And we realized that they were vacationing with their family in Hawaii. So for them, it was mid morning. Why wouldn't we get on a call before the weekend. So really, you never know where people are. You never know what their schedule is, but just keep it short, keep it concise, and always go under whatever you say. If you say you're going to take up 30 minutes of somebody's time, set a timer and take up 25 minutes. Always take up less than what you say you're going to take up. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because our time is up. <laughs> I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to take up any more of your time. I love all this advice. And, and just so everyone knows, I'm not interjecting that much because Kim, I mean, <laughs> the wealth of information, and I don't need to say anything else. I would just be repeating what she says. So um, if you want to get more of Kim, um, you can definitely get more of her first and foremost on LinkedIn. This is why she does her podcast on LinkedIn, I am sure. Um, and then also she she uh, does LinkedIn learning. So uh, go check out her courses. Um, they're very well done. I was checking them out. <laughs> this week um, and almost didn't get prepped for this podcast because I was so enthralled with her. <laughs> but um, just before we go, Kim, thank you again so much for joining us today. I, I, You are such an inspiration. And I know so many people um, who have been watching your career journey are inspired. I just had one of my interns the other day say, do you know Kim Kaup? And I was like, yes. <laughs> She's like, she's so inspiring. So, you know, I run into people all the time um, that are inspired by you. And I know it's hard for people like us that are putting content out there all the time. Sometimes we have these days where we're like, is anyone listening or am I just talking to myself? Um, but just so you know, a lot of people are are really talking about you. I see it um, every day in the work that I do. Um, but thank you so much. And before we go, I just want to give you an opportunity. Is there anything you want to pitch to our Pitch Live community about how to get in touch with you or or what's the best way to connect with you and get more information about what you're teaching? I would pitch that we should absolutely connect on LinkedIn. And I would offer a little bit of homework, which is if you're one of those people that are scratching your head right now going, gosh, LinkedIn, I don't even think I've logged into that platform in six months. Uh, my homework assignment would be lo log in uh, as much as you can. Try to clean it up. I'm happy to help. So let's connect. And I'll give you all my tips and tricks on how to do that really quickly. But I think as much as you can, start to leverage the power of LinkedIn SEO and, and use it for your own advantage. Well, thank you again so much. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Pitch Live with Amy Summers. And be sure to hit that subscribe button and give us a rating or review. Your feedback helps us plan future episodes. And I hope you were inspired today by Kim uh, to get out there, pitch, advocate for yourself, make success happen. Um, as a bonus, join us at inisivox.com where you can get motivated, hone your communication skills, Binge as much mentorship as you want whenever you need it. Uh, the link uh, for that is going to be in the show notes along with all of Kim's links. Thank you again, Kim. And until next time, let's MSH. Bye. Bye. <laughs>